Hello, friends. This is Pastor J.D. Lee from Harvest Baptist Church of Allen, Texas. We're about to take you to one of the messages from the pulpit at Harvest Baptist Church, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. Pray that you'll enjoy this song just before the preaching. And may God richly bless you. Thank you for listening.
Ruth tonight. You'll see what I mean here. And uh, praise the Lord. I appreciate the good spirit in the house of God. I'm glad we have a place and we can come. Amen. And uh, it's going to be preaching time now. And I'm thankful for the Word of God. Amen. It'll make a difference. The Bible will change your life. And uh, one way or another, it'll make you bitter. Amen. Or better, depending on how you Amen. respond to it and what you do with it. But I want to try to help us tonight and be an encouragement. Amen. I, I listened in this afternoon to a couple of messages around the country from some of my preacher friends. And I, I like to hear other preaching too. And I, right. I got some help this afternoon. And uh, listening to some other preachers, I said, well, I'm glad I'm not the only one. I'm not a lunatic out here on my own island, amen. There's some men preaching the Bible, even on Mother's Day. And one preacher, he preached real hard for about 15 minutes, and he'd stop his night and say, and happy Mother's Day. I said, well, you just got to get that in. That's good. Right there, God. Ruth chapter 1, if you found your place, I want to invite you to stand if you're physically willing and able as we give reverence to the Word of God. Ruth. I never thought I'd preach a Mother's Day message out of this book, but this is what happens when you read your Bible. Hey, man, you find stuff sometimes you're not looking for. I, I appreciate the Lord doing that. But Ruth chapter number 1, and we'll begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of that man was Elimelech. And the name of his wife, Naomi. And the name of his two sons, Malion and Chilion. Uh, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab. And notice it says, and continued there. That's, there's so much preaching here. I'm going to try to get through this and then we'll try to break it down. But it says in verse 3, And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left and her two sons. I wonder why he died. Probably because he continued in the wrong place. Hmm. Well, if you continue, can I just go ahead and hit that while I'm there? If you continue in the wrong place because you leave the right place, you know what you're going to do? You're going to die spiritually. You're going to die spiritually. And I'll show you that in the Bible here in just a few moments. But in verse 5 it says, I'm sorry, verse 6 says, Then she arose with her daughters. Uh, let me read it right here. In verse, in verse number, uh, verse number uh, 3, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. They dwelled about ten years. And Malion and Chilion died also, both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them, notice what it says, bread. Cassidy, y'all pay attention now. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her and they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to, his, to her mother's house the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that you find, may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And, she, and they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight, and should bear, also bear sons, would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Would ye stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. And they lifted up their voice and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people and unto her gods, lowercase g. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. Where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people. Notice what she says. And thy God, my God. That's the key to the entire passage. Where thou diest, will I die. And there will I be buried. Uh, but uh, uh, the Lord do so to me and more also if aught but death part thee and me and when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her then she left speaking unto her so they two went until they came to Bethlehem and it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them and said is this Naomi 
And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call you me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me. Father, we need your help tonight. I pray, dear God, that you would speak through the pages of Scripture. Uh, Lord, this message tonight is yet to be seen. Uh, Lord, how it would be delivered. But I pray that you would deliver it through me in and of me. Uh, I pray, dear God, that you would empty me of self, fill me with your spirit, and allow me to preach in clarity and with conviction, God, the truth that you've given us tonight. I pray that you speak to the hearts, not just to the mamas, not just to the ladies, but to all of us tonight. I pray you speak to our hearts, not only those that are here in attendance physically, but those that will catch uh, the live stream. Well, we don't do a live stream, but God, the recording of it uh, later on on the internet. I pray, dear God, that you'd have your hand upon us, God, now. Speak to our hearts. Bring deep conviction where it's needed. Bring uh, solemn comfort where it is needed. Uh, but nonetheless, bring confirmation that we will be confirmed, uh, conformed to the image of your darling son through the pages of scripture now. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing out of respect for the word of God. When I look into this particular passage of scripture, I, I, I think I've shared this with you many times before and I don't mind sharing it, but when I read the Bible, I often try to read between the lines for the purpose of not to manipulate the scriptures, not to come up with some kind of a new idea, but rather to find myself, my place in the Word of God. How does this apply? You know, I haven't said this in a while, so let me say it here. When we're studying the Word of God, to rightly divide the Word of God, there's a few questions that we need to ask ourselves when we approach the Bible. The first thing is, is we need to ask the question this, is, who is speaking? Who is speaking? That tells us who's the author. What is, you know, if we step back from that, the, the, the very, in a crux of everything, the really the main question that we would ask is this. What is the central idea of the text? That is really what we need to know when we're preaching the Word of God and we're studying the Word of God. This is not just for preachers. Hopefully I'm preaching to a bunch of people that read their Bibles. If, if you don't read your Bible, you're ignorant, and I mean that in the literal sense of the word, and you're anemic spiritually, and when battles come, you're not going to win those battles because if you don't eat spiritually, guess what? You won't have any spiritual strength, amen? And uh, go go two or three days without physical food and see how well that you fare, how strong you are. You won't be strong very long, friend. I'm telling you, I went a couple of two or, well, it seemed like I went for about a year and was not able to really, truly eat spirit, uh, physical food and I got really weak and sick and I, I became what they call malabsorbed. I, I was not getting any nutrition. And it's amazing. Uh, I had surgery, what, three weeks ago now. I feel better tonight than I have felt in over a year and a half. You know why? Because I'm not weak anymore. I feel the strength, amen, physically. You know why? Because I'm able to eat and it's actually being retained. That's a blessing from God. Hey, but if I can understand that, I'm telling you how much greater, how much more value there is in digesting the Word of God. And that being said, when we approach the Word of God, it's the first question would be no doubt, what is the central theme of the text? But then we would ask this question, who is speaking? Amen. What is being said? Amen. To whom is he speaking? And then the question is this, how does that apply to me? And so that's how we need to approach the Word of God. How does that apply? I mean, Ruth, come on. I've read the book of Ruth a hundred thousand times. Amen. It's an easy book. You can read it in five minutes. I mean, if, you, if you're a fast reader, it still retains itself. Amen. It's not a hard book to read. And we get excited. There's a lot in the book of Ruth. But I never saw this until the other day I was reading through just passing through in the book of Ruth and I wasn't even looking for a message I thought I had both of my Mother's Day messages ready to go and I was ready to preach them and man the Lord began to deal with my heart I actually thought that I would preach this passage this morning and that was where I was settled on and I had a different message I was going to preach tonight and then I kept on reading just imagine that and the very next day I got up and I read the, I started reading the book of First Samuel and that's where we got the message for this morning it's amazing how God will do that but that being said, I just want you to understand, I was reading between the lines to try to understand where I would fit into this. And that's how I came up with the title. And so the title of the message, I know it'll be a little different. I told you I've never preached this before in my life. And, uh, but it don't matter, it's the Bible, amen? And I believe God's given me a thought. If I can just communicate it the way that it's in my heart, I think you'll get some help. But here's the, here's the message tonight. The, the, the message, the title of the message is simply this. The value 
of a mother's godly influence. The value of a mother's godly influence. Notice I did not just say the value of a mother's influence. Listen, this primarily obviously is because it's Mother's Day is targeted to the mothers, but it, it applies to all of us. Let me say this. Every single mother has an influence. You do whether you like it or not, but don't feel so isolated there. Every single father has an influence, amen, whether it's good or whether it's bad. And it doesn't just stop there. Everybody in this room has an influence on somebody, amen, whether it's good or whether it's bad. I, I, I'm telling you, you have influence on people, whether you think you do or whether you think you don't. People watch you. No, they don't watch you. Yes, they do. They watch you. A lot of people will justify their sin based upon how you live your life. A lot of people will get close to God based upon how you influence them. And so what I'm talking about tonight is not just influence, amen, but the value, Cassidy, of a godly influence. There's a difference right there. You say, I would have never seen that. I'm telling you right now, a casual glance of the book of Ruth, you would not casually read that and say, well, there's a godly woman right there. Not at all. In fact, just the opposite. And I try to unpack this a little bit. I won't be long, but just let me unpack it for a minute. It's a little bit different, I know. But man, when you look at this and you really begin to dissect this passage of Scripture, you know what you see? You do not see a godly influence at all. As a matter of fact, I see a woman that probably... Now, here's the, here's the one thing about Ruth. Ruth probably should have told her husband, I'm not going to leave the house of bread. And I'll be honest with you, she's commanded to follow her husband even when he leads her the wrong way. Now that's where it gets difficult. You, you understand? She doesn't have the authority to rebel against her husband. Her husband did not lead her into sin, so to speak, but he did lead her away from God. Now there's a, there's a, and that's a tough one. So we have to be very careful and delicate there and understand uh, that, uh, can, let me give you another example. We, we've already preached through this. Remember Abraham, uh, Abram, in the book of Genesis, Abram went to a place he should have never been to. He went to where? He went to Egypt, the world. And God told him they should have never went there, but they went ahead and went there, and what did he do? He told his wife, he said, honey, you're so pretty. He said, you're fair to look upon. Y'all, I, I mean, we just preached this not long ago on Sunday morning, but he said, I want you to tell them that you're my sister. Now, she was his half-sister. Now, that's weird to us, I know. But you've got to understand the lineage back then. I mean, they all, I mean, there was, uh, they married within the tribe on purpose, amen? That's a whole other message in this passage as well. But long story short, you know what, you know what Sarah did? She obeyed him. The New Testament tells us that Sarah obeyed Abram to the point she even called him Lord. Do you know what Lord means? Does anybody know what Lord means? You know what the word means? The definition, the very definition of the word Lord means master. Amen? Now, was he mean to her? Show me one passage of scripture where Abraham was mean to his wife. You won't find it. Show me one passage of scripture where he talked down to her like she was a piece of trash. You will not find it. Show me one place. So what are you saying? Don't get so upset because we live in a generation that has perverted the word of God. She understood that he was her authority. That's what she was recognizing, okay? He did wrong. Right, and they paid the price. Remember just last Sunday? Good night, we preached about this son that was not the promise of God. Amen. Ishmael came on the scene, which we're still reaping problems because of that right there, by the way, because of the bond woman. Are you all with me? That ain't my message. But what I'm trying to get you to understand, Ruth did one thing right. She submitted to her husband even when he was wrong. Now, ladies, this is hard. This is very hard. I get that. Because your flesh is going to say, no, no, I don't want to do that. L listen, I'm not talking about a, a man that will take you blatantly and get you to sin against God. That's not what we're talking about. But we're talking about poor leadership. There's a difference. Are, are you now, that poor leadership may lead you to a place of disaster. You'll see right here. Because they here's the biggest mistake they made. They left the house of God. Bethlehem, Judah, the very meaning of it is the house of bread. Do you understand that? The house of bread. And so they left the house of bread and uh, and they went to a place they never should have been. And so it says uh, that they went, notice where it went to though. They went into the country of Moab and continued there. Moab, there's nothing good in the Bible ever said about Moab or the Moabites. Y'all understand that? There's not one good thing God says about Moab. Not one. Nothing good about the Moabites. Nothing at all. In fact, they're enemies of God. And I don't have time to unpack the whole message on the Moabites. I'd like to do that, but I don't have time. So understand that Ruth did something probably... Uh, no, Ruth, I keep saying, I keep saying Ruth. Naomi, I'm, I'm sorry. We're in the book of Ruth. Naomi is the one that we're talking about here for a minute. 
Naomi just simply did one thing. She obeyed her husband. He was wrong. He was wrong. It cost him dearly. It cost him dearly because of that decision. Now, you look at that passage of Scripture casually, you're not going to come away and say, yep, yep, that's a godly mama right there. That's a mama with some godly influence. But if you'll stay with me for just a little bit and pay attention, I hope that I can show you from the Word of God how you can deduct that and pull that out from the passage of Scripture without twisting the Scripture. I'm not going to twist the Scripture. It's there. So let's just do something. Let's look at the value of a mother's godly influence. I, I, I struggle with the title. I'm going to be honest with you. I started, a, I wrote five different titles down and scratched it and threw it away. I mean, I kept struggling. I said, well, I think we ought to call it never underestimate the value of a godly influence. And that, that didn't work. And then I, so this is what I came up with because I was tired of trying to figure it out. And so if it don't work, oh well. Don't worry about the title. Don't get hung up on the title. Just get the message. Amen. But I want to talk about the value. Why is it valued? Why is there value in a, a, a mother's godly influence? And how you see that? Well, just stay with me. I think the only way that we can do this and rightly divide it is simply to take a look at the life of Naomi. There's some things about Naomi's life that you and I need to see in order to rightly divide and consider the truth that is before us. So I want you to see, first of all, when we look at the life of Naomi, I see some things. The first thing I see in these passages of Scripture, these verses, I see this. I see a bunch of regrets. I see the regrets. Hey, ma'am, is there anybody so arrogant that would stand up tonight and say, Hey, preacher, I, in my life I have no regrets. I, I'd say you're a fool if you even try to think that way. There's not anybody that's above that. And if you think you are, God help you, you need to get right with God because there's not anybody in this room, hey, ma'am, even from the youngest, I could say, Cassidy, have you ever got a whooping? Did you, have, did you regret what you did to get the whooping? See, even at the youngest age, they understand regret. Say amen right there. Well, that's good preaching right there. I'm telling you, the first thing I see about the life of Naomi is a life of regrets. There's some regrets, amen. I've never met anybody that didn't have some regrets. I, I, I told you a minute ago, one of my biggest regrets is not serving God. My regret is not getting saved. My regret is not, I'm, I don't regret that God put me under the old time men of God that weren't afraid to preach with a leather love. And a tear filled eye. I'm thankful for that. I don't regret that a bit. I don't regret that I came up in the old time way and that it's still in my soul. I don't regret that a bit. I don't regret every dime that I've ever given to the work of God. I don't regret that. I don't regret every ounce of time, every ounce of talent, all the tears, all the treasure. I don't regret none of that. But I tell you what, I do regret more than anything. I regret that the times when I messed up, I should have been walking with God and I wasn't. The times where I brought a lot of heartache in my own life was because. I didn't listen to the word of God when I could have. That's the biggest regret that I have. And I'm telling you, Ruth, is a, the, the book of Ruth tells us that Naomi had a life of regrets. Let me, let me show you some of the regrets here quickly. I'm going to try to preach and get out of the way. Let me show you some of the regrets of Naomi's life. The regrets. Number one, I see one of the regrets of her life. Number one was a breadless famine. A breadless famine. Verse number one says, It came to pass... There was a famine in the land. You know what the famine means? There wasn't no bread. What is Bethlehem? I already told you. Bethlehem Judah in itself means a house of bread. Are you listening? Hey, there's no bread. There's a breadless famine. It said that there was a famine and they went to sojourn. You know what sojourn means? They weren't going to camp out there. Oh, Lord, help me. They weren't going to stay there. They're like everybody else in the world today. Well, I'm not really leaving the church preacher. I just feel like I'm not getting fed. I feel like there's no bread in the house of God. So I'm just going to go over here and see if I can get some help. Hey Amen. I'm talking about people that's in the right kind of churches. I'm not talking about the kind of churches where you really ain't getting no bread. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about you've heard the same preacher preach for all your life and you feel like he's just not feeding you. It's probably because you've turned a deaf ear to the preacher. But I'm just telling you, hey, here's what happened is there's no bread and they went to sojourn. You know what that means? Sojourn means they just want to pass through. We're just going to step out here and get a little bread. Are, are you with me? Stay. I don't have time to unpack all this, but here, that's the idea. We're going to pass through. We're not going to stay there. Oh no, we're just going to visit. Y'all with me? We're just going to visit. And somebody say, well, preacher, I'm not really going to stay 
in the world. Are you listening? I just want to go visit it. I feel like I'm missing out on something. I had to just go to sojourn. And that, that probably was the right mindset. Well, we're not going to stay there. You know, maybe he said his wife and boys down said, now, honey, listen, we're not going to leave this place. This is the house of bread. This is the house of God. No doubt about that. But right now, it's kind of tough. Things are tough. I think we better step outside and go somewhere else. Does that not remind you of Abram and Sarah? Come on, the same thing. You know what history teaches us? That man doesn't learn from history. You know what we do? We keep doing the same stupid sins over and over from Adam all the way to this day. We're doing the same stupid things we've ever done. You know why? Because we just don't learn. So they went to soldier. Now that wouldn't be so bad if they were just going to pass through. Abraham didn't go to stay in Egypt either. He went to soldier. But notice what happened there. Why did this happen? The regrets of a breathless famine says this. It says... At the end of verse 2, they came into the country of Moab, and notice what it says, and continued there. That's a regret. I regret, I, I continue here. I want y'all to hear Naomi testify for a little bit tonight, all right? This is different, I know, but it will hurt you. Can you hear Naomi? I got a word of testimony. I wish we'd have never gone down there. I wish we'd have never gone down there because we got comfortable. We got comfortable. We didn't have no bone-faced, uh, bread-faced, uh, bony-fingered man of God pointing his finger at us, telling us what we need to do with our life, telling us how to get right, learn how to be faithful, learn how to do what God already told you how to do. I mean, we don't have that. I, I, I mean, I miss that, but I'm telling you, I regret going there because we got comfortable. We stayed around. You know, could it be they got comfortable with the provisions? Instead of trusting God by faith to take care of them, they went ahead and found a way to find provision outside of God's house. That's exactly, I mean, I ain't even got time to deal with all. I, I, I probably shouldn't have been off this. I've been off more than I can chew tonight. But amen, it's here. So there's a regret of a breadless famine. I'm going to hurry and get through these. Number two, the, the regret of a breadless famine. But not only that, there's a regret I see here of a buried family. Not only is there a breadless famine, there's a buried family. Look at verse number three. Verse number three says, Elimelech, Naomi's husband died. And she was left alone. But now you go to verse five. And verse five says, And Malion and Chilion died also. You know what she just did? She just had to bury her whole family. Why? Because they left the house of God. They left the place of... You know what, what I have wrote in my Bible? What they did is they shifted boundaries. God put them in a place of boundary, a place of bread, and they left those. They shifted boundaries, and as a result, now she's buried her whole family. Hey, do you think she regrets that? Do you think she regrets burying her husband and then her two sons ten years later? I mean, it, it, apparently what ended up happening is after he died, we don't know how much time passed, but then all of a sudden her boys got married. And by the way, who'd they marry? They married Moabitess girls. You want to get a little history lesson on the Moabites? The Moabitess girls had a bad testimony. They were mostly whores and prostitutes. They were not good. In fact, so much so that it shocked them, and we'll see that a little bit further on, it shocked them that Ruth wasn't like the Moabitess girls because all the Moabitess girls had a bad reputation. They were street corner girls. Are y'all with me? I'm telling you, go study your Bible. Everything I'm telling you is biblical, and it's right. I'm just giving you it in a nutshell because you're too lazy to go. No, I'm just kidding. You can go check it out. But I'm telling you, you know what? It's an amazing thing to me. Them boys should have never been in Moab in the first place. And they've already violated God's word because they left the place of bread. But now the boys got no other choice, amen, but to marry in their surroundings. And guess what they ended up doing? Marrying a couple of Moabitess girls. Not good. It's not good. They married out of God's will. Amen. But, but, but I'm just stay with me. So there's the regret of a breadless famine. There's the regret of a buried family. I wonder if she didn't ever think, man, if we'd have just stayed. If we'd have just stayed around. The bread would have came back. You know, sometimes you think, you think you're in a famine. You know what you better... Can I help? Can I just run a rabbit real quick? I just feel like I need to hit this for me. And if y'all need it, mine take it, but it's for me. You know what I learned a long time ago, Brother James? And I'm telling you, I don't got a lot of things figured out. There's a lot of things I could probably do better. There's a lot of things I mess up on. I'm not going to lie to you about that, but I'm going to tell you one thing I got settled in deep in my soul. When the storms of life come, and the famines, if you will, you know what you do? You don't do a blessed thing. Right. You don't make a decision in the storms of life. You know what you better learn to do? When the, rage, when the sea is raging and the wind is contrary to your life, you better learn to stand still. You better wait on God because when the wind's blowing and the rain's falling, you can't see clear enough to discern the will of God and the direction of God and it may cost you your very family. You better bless God learn to stand still in the midst of a famine. 
When you say, well, I'm starving, God will never leave his own. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Either that's Bible or it's not. And if you trust that the God of heaven will provide for you, then whenever it gets famine and it gets real hard and it gets difficult, just stay put. Because guess what we find out? Bread did come back eventually. They're going to get back to the bread. But look what it cost them. Hey, Amen. I'm just saying, there's a regret of a buried family. I wonder if she didn't have those moments I wish we'd have just stayed put. Maybe I'd still have my husband at night. Maybe my, my boys would have married right and we'd still have a family. Maybe we'd have some grandbabies. I don't know what went through her mind. I'm just talking about the, the, the notice here. I know we got to get through all this negative to get the positive. But just stay with me. Aren't you glad I'm starting with the negative and ending with the positive tonight? Hey, Amen. I see the regrets of a breathless family, a buried family, but I see something else. Uh, all these regrets just seem to pile up, don't they? They seem to. Do you ever hurt the term when it rains, it pours? Hey, Amen. That, that, if there's ever a case where when it rains, it pours, look at it. Now you see a breathless famine, a buried family, but I see something else in verse 8. I see a broken farewell. There's a broken farewell. There's some hard, tear-filled farewells that would have never had to be there. Amen. You know what? Can I just... Hey, think about this for a minute. I'm never going to get this preached tonight. I can already tell. But think about this for a minute. Did you read a verse in your Bible anywhere in these first few verses that when they left Bethlehem, Judah... They were broken hearted and crying mm. and tear filled. Not one verse. Not one time. They weren't sad about leaving the house. Think about this for a minute now. Not one verse says when they left the house of God, they were tore out a friend about it. They were going to be missing the man of God. They were going to be missing the people. No, there's not a tear shed. Not one tear shed. Because they weren't sorry that they left until it came down to the regrets. Now, keep that in mind and watch what happens. This is a totally different story here now. Verse 8. Verse 8 says this. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them. Notice what it says. And they lift up their voice and wept. I'm talking about brokenness. Friend, there was no brokenness about leaving the house of God. Are you getting it? There was not a broken heart about leaving God's house. They weren't sad about it at all. They were thinking about one thing, self. Well, I need to be satisfied. I'm hungry. I need me. No, listen. When you get your eyes on self, you won't worry about the people you're going to hurt in the process. But, but now, now that's all past. And there's a regret because now there's a broken. They didn't know nothing about a broken farewell. She wept. They wept, the Bible says. And it goes on. And I don't have time to, to look at it all the way through. But look down here in verse number 14. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth claimed unto her. She tells both of them to go back. Go back and worship the gods. Amen. The, the gods of what? The gods of Moab. That's the whole point. They worshiped other gods. They worshiped false gods. God. That's why God said he wanted nothing to do with right. them. They were supposed to be annihilated because they were the enemies of God. They should have never been there. That's all hindsight. And she tells both of them, go back and worship your false gods and I'm going back to where I know I'm supposed to be. And one of them had no problem with it. She went on back. No regret. Oh, thank God. I'm out of here. But then one of them said, I don't know about you, but that life has never been satisfying to me. There's something different. I, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I can imagine there was something that caused Ruth to say, you know what? I've already had that life. I've already experienced that. I've already worshipped the false gods. And they have never satisfied. And they're not going to fix the problem that I've got. But I'm just going to stay with you if that's alright. I've already lost everything. I don't have anything to go back to. I've lost my husband. You're the only thing that I've got. And I know that you serve the God who is. You'll see what she says in a moment. She says, your God is going to be my God. Because there's something different about your God. Now, hold on to that thought in your mind for a minute. The regrets of a broken farewell. I see something else, too. I'm just talking about the regrets. We, we got like three or four points when we're done. Y'all look bored. I'm talking about the regrets of a broken farewell. But another regret that I see in Naomi's life, this is terrible. This is where it really gets where the rubber meets the road. I see the regret of a blurred familiarity. Well, what do you mean a blurred familiarity? Can I say it this way? She was no longer recognizable. Look at verse 19. Verse 19 says, So they too went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city... Now wait a minute. How did the whole city know her? Oh, I wonder what kind of influence they had there when they were there. I'm just saying, just, just hold on now. It said all the city... The whole city's looking... 
and said, all the city was moved about them. Notice what they said now. And they said, is this, I don't know how they said it, but it's something to the effect of, is this Naomi? What happened to you? Is that you, Naomi? Wow, you ain't been gone but about 15 years. 20 years. Is that you? You know what happened? She wasn't recognizable. Excuse me just a minute. You know what happens when you leave the place of God? You leave the place of God's house and the place of bread and you go out after your own agenda trying to satisfy self. If you ever do make it back, you'll not be the same. People won't be able to recognize you. I'm telling you something. There'll be something blurred about the familiarity. We think we know you, but we're not sure. You don't look the same. Now, it's amazing how that happens because there's some things that are going to happen here. I see that not only there's a blurred familiarity, but I see this, the last regret that I see in her life is this, and this is the, probably the worst one of them all in, in verse number 20. Look at verse number 20. And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi. Call me Mara. Excuse me, does anybody know what Mara means? Did you remember the... Go back to Moses for a minute. I, am I giving you all too much Bible tonight? Go back to Moses for just a minute. In the wilderness, there was a brook that they couldn't drink out of. You know what the brook was called? Mara. It was bitter. And God had to make the bitter water where they could drink it. Did He not? Y'all know that's in the book of Exodus, right? She said, call me not Naomi. That's who I used to be. Call me Mara. You know what she's saying? I'm bitter. There's a regret of a bitter feeling. I'm talking about some regrets, friend. There's a regret. In, in her life, there's a regret of a breadless famine, a buried family, a broken farewell, blurred familiarity, and a bitter feeling. I'm talking about some regrets, friend. There's some regrets. We're just looking at the life of Naomi. How do we get to the place where we find the value of a mother's godly influence? Well, number one, I see the regrets. Number two, I see something else in Naomi's life that will help us to see this. I see the recognitions. There's some recognitions in her life. It didn't come to after the regrets. By the way, can I help you? Sometimes you've got to go through some things of God's chastisement to come to the place where you can realize what's really going on. See, sometimes God's going to let you go through the worst things in your life, and you think it's to destroy you. Can I help you? If God wanted to destroy us, all you got to do is just, he don't, all you got to do is take his hand off. He don't have to thump you on the head. He don't have to kill you. All he's got to do is take his hand off your life, son, and you'll destroy yourself. Say amen. That's the truth for everybody. He don't have to. But see, God's intention for His children when He brings you through the hard times and, and lets you go through some, it's not to destroy you. It's to bring you to the place where you wake up and realize what's important and what's not. Now, the problem is most people don't, and then He has to take them out. He has to kill them. And, and you know that's the case all through the Bible. And, and so, but, but I see something here. After a, a life of regret... I see that Naomi recognized some things here. Something brought her to the place where she was awake and she saw that some things that she should have seen a long time ago and she realized that, boy, I can remember. I, I, I would try not to get ahead of myself. There's so I'm so excited about this passage of Scripture, but I see something that was recognized. First thing I see that she recognized is in verse 21. I, I look at verse 21. I see this. I see blessings. She recognized there were some blessings in her life that she had forsaken. She forsook some blessings in her life. You, you want to you see it? Look at verse 21. Look at verse 21. She made a statement that tells us she recognized something finally. I don't know if she just now came to realize this or what, but she's finally in a place where she's ready to do business with God. Yeah. I'll show you that in a minute. Yeah. But she recognized, first of all, that God had blessed her in the past, and she's forsaken those blessings because look at verse 21. Notice what she says. She made the statement, I went. First thing she said was, I went. You know what that tells me? She made a choice. She made a choice. But not, not, only, not only did she go, look at how she went. Look at it. Look at verse 21. She says, I went. Notice what it says. Out. What's the word, church? Oh. Say it again. Oh. She went out. How? Oh. I don't know if you know anything about your Bible or not, but that word full has everything to do with the blessings of God. Everything to do with the blessings of God. Now, hold on a minute. I'm a little confused. I thought that I read, I'm reading from the King James. That's the Bible. Y'all know that? Verse 1. Look at verse 1 again. And verse 2. Does it help me? Because I might have amnesia, but I'm pretty sure that I just read that there was a famine in the land. Is that right? 
I don't know. I'm not the smartest guy, but I've never heard of anybody being full during a famine. In fact, a famine is a time of emptiness, a time of doing without. Is that right at all? What did she say? She now, after all this is over, she says, I went out full. You know what she just said? I messed up. I messed up. I had everything. We didn't need bread. We had the blessings of God in our life. We were where we were supposed to be. We were in the place of God's blessing. She recognized the, the blessings she had. She turned them for them. She took them for granted. Can I just say something? Not just to the mamas, but to all of us. You better pay it. You better wake up. And you better pay solid, close, somber attention to the fact that if your life is blessed when you're anywhere near the house of God, it, it's not a coincidence. It's absolutely the purpose of God. And He's not going to bless you outside of that. And why in God's name do we keep trying to run outside of the boundaries of God thinking, well, God's blessing me here, but if I go here, no, it's not going to ever work that way. It never has and it never will. You and I must learn to stay in the place of God's blessing. The day will come. We'll wake up and realize... I was full. I had what I needed. No. I was satisfied with bread. Say amen. Mm -hmm. We're talking about spiritual bread. Amen. Yes. Hey, she recognized the blessings that have been forsaken. Right. What were they? It didn't matter. The point, what she said, said it all. I was full when I left there. How are you full? I want to ask Naomi when we get to heaven. Just for my own, it won't matter then, but you know, carnally right now, I still think that way. <laughs> Naomi, sister, how could you say that you were in a famine and that's the reason you left? Yet you said later on, after you had a broken goodbye and you had to bury your family, and you said that you were full when you did leave. Well, excuse me for a minute. If you're full in the house of God and the bread kind of dries up, why are you leaving? Mm. Naomi, what are you doing? I want to go back to Elimelech and say, Sir, Excuse me, sir. Do you understand you're about to mess up your whole family? Maybe we'll preach on him on Father's Day. Because there's a lot I like to bust his hide for. <laughs> Amen. It's in the book. Why'd you leave? Your family was fine. They were blessed. Your two boys were fed. They could have stayed in the house of God and married right. She, she realized they had forsaken some blessings. Not only that, I want to tell you something else she realized, though. This is where it gets good, y'all. This is so so simple, it's embarrassing. But this is where it gets good. And maybe it's just me and the Lord having devotions here tonight, but I hope you get in on it. She realized a couple of things. Number one, she realized that she had been blessed and she forsook the blessings of God. But I'll tell you something. She, well, thank, thank God for this. This is where we can just stop, take a time out, and shout hallelujah for about an hour. Because she realized something that I think most people are struggling to realize and they need to wake up and realize it. She realized that she had, all along, a bringing father. Mm. She had a bringing father. You said, what in the world? No, look at your text. <laughs> look at verse 21 again. No, no, no doubt she realized that there were blessings forsaken. She said, I went out full. But notice what she says after that. Oh, I wish you could get the correlation. She says, I went out. She did that of her own accord. She made the choice. But notice the difference in, in the same part. She said, and the Lord hath brought me. She said, the Lord hath brought me home empty. You know what she just said? She just realized something. The time without bread, the burying of her family, the broken heartedness she experienced and the sad goodbyes. You know what she just realized? All of it was at the hand of my Heavenly Father bringing me to a place of emptiness. And I'm telling you, the greatest day in your life and the greatest day in my life is when we recognize that it is God Almighty who has a desire to fill us up. And the reason He can't fill us up is we're too full of everything else. He's got to empty us. And God's emptying plan is never fun. Happy Mother's Day. See, it don't work for me. I try to be like that. <laughs> no. I'll tell you the truth of the matter is, 
The greatest day you'll ever have in the rest of your life is you get a hold of this truth and make it part of your life for real. I'm talking about she realized, you know, she just realized, I have a father who's bringing me. Right. He's bringing me along. He is bringing me to the place of heartache. He brought me there. He brought me, mm -hmm. amen, to the place where I had to bury my husband. He brought me there. And he brought me and my two boys. And he brought us to the place where they married these women. And these boys both died. He brought me there. He brought me to the place where I was going to say goodbye and go back. I know I need to get back. I know I need to get back. I don't know how many, you know what I thought about? I don't know how many years that she had a conversation with her daughters-in-law and her sons and said, you know what? We got to get back to the house of God. Things just ain't the same here. Things just ain't the same here. I know we're eating good. I know we got a lot of things and a lot of stuff and man it seems like we're blessed but I'm telling you and maybe she kept the cry a little bit I just got a feel she got testifying to those boys hey man oh your daddy would still be with us we got to get back to the house of God what well, I always wonder why she didn't go before they got married I, I'm just telling you there's a lot of questions in my mind but I don't know but if, over the years it wasn't nagging on her and nagging on her and nagging on her she said you know what boys I, 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 I mean it this time I, I know you're in love I'm going to let you get married and after you get married we're going back to the house of God y'all just go on with your life. I'm going back to the house of God. And then the other one got married. And maybe she said, well, okay, I'll wait till you get married and get you married off. I'm going back to the house of God. Things are not the same here. There's something about being in the house of God. There's something about the people of God. I need to get back to the house of God. I don't ever remember this much heartache in the house of God. Amen. Because whatever I was going through, he was right there. I don't know the conversations, but maybe then when the, she stayed around and the daughters-in-law, then she began to tell them how it used to be. I I remember when the bread was fresh and hot and God was feeding our soul. We had everything we needed. We were so full of the blessings of God and full of the presence of God. Oh, someday I'm going to go back there, girls. I know. I want y'all to take good care of my son. I'm going back. Give me a grandbaby before I go. I don't know the conversation, but I'm telling you, there must have been something about the conversations that she had with Naomi, I mean with Ruth and with Orpha, that, that something resonated and said, I don't know. And maybe Ruth would lay in bed at night and she would think about it and say, you know, I don't know about, I don't know about Mama Naomi, but something about Mama Naomi, she's not quite the same. She keeps loving Longing for a place that we've never been to. Longing for a place that we've never seen. She keeps telling me how good it is. And we have heard of the God of Israel. How that He has blessed them. We know because we're in Moab. Come on now. We know about the enemies of God. We know how God's people always win. And God always shows favor. I, I just don't know. I can't shake it. There's something different about her. And maybe when the heartache came and they looked at Naomi and they said, how in the world could Naomi, how could you bury your husband? And now you've buried your two sons. And you still keep talking about going back to the house of God. I don't know what the conversation was. The Bible don't tell us. It's left to our imagination. Maybe you don't have one. But I'm telling you something. I put myself there and say, how was it? What was real life like? There had to be something when she began to recognize. Maybe she's testifying. Obviously she is to the people, no doubt. But maybe before that she testified to her daughter-in-law. and said, let me tell you something. I used to have it made. I don't know about God was so good to me. God was so good to me and He gave me and a little like these two boys. And man, they were a blessing. I'm telling you, we were blessed. I, I made a mistake and we left there. And I left. And, and, but she recognizes that she has a Father in Heaven who's brought her to everything. But at the same time, He's brought her through it. And all of a sudden, Him bringing her has allowed for something in her life to cause Ruth to say, I ain't leaving her. It wasn't because she was afraid to leave Naomi alone. It wasn't that at all. But I think this, I'm going to just tell you, I, I'm, I'm kind of speculating, but I think the, tr the proof is in the pudding, so to speak. If you disagree, next time you preach, you preach it how you want to. But I'm going to tell you right now, there was something so different about her that even Ruth, in the midst of her life of messed upness and her life of sin, her life of rebellion and backsliding condition. Now, by the way, let me just say this. I've been out of God's will, amen, but I've never been out of His care. Say amen right there. He's a faithful Father. He provides for His own even when they're out of His will. We know that all through the Bible. But something about Naomi had Ruth's attention. And when it was time to say goodbye, she wasn't interested in going back to that life. She wasn't interested in going back to those false gods. Keep that in mind. 
So now we see the recognitions. I see the recognition of blessings forsaken. We see the recognition of a bringing father. She said, the Lord hath brought. His, it was his chastisement. That's what I put on my notes right there. It was through his chastisement. By the way, you go read Hebrews 12. You know the purpose of chastisement? Is that God can get glory out of you. Amen. God's going to take you through some things when you get out of his will. If you're truly his child, by the way, that's where I get excited right there. Because he don't do that for the devil's youngness. If you can violate God's word, and you can neglect the house of God and the book of God and the things that God has told you to do, if you can do that and you're not truly going through chastisement, can I say something to you? You're not saved. You're not saved. It's not possible that you can violate God's word and not be under serious chastisement. Because Hebrews 12 says, hey, every son, he, he chasteneth every son. But he don't chasten those that, if you be without chastisement, you are a bastard and not a son. That means you've never been born again. Thank God Naomi's proven right here that she is obviously a child of God. Amen. It's his chastisement that brought her to the place of infamous. But this gets better. It gets real good right here. I see, number one, the life of regrets. I see the regrets. I hope you see the regrets. Mm -hmm. I see the recognitions. Hey, thank God for recognition. But then I see something else that turns the whole story to a different light. This is where I really got hung up. And I don't even know if I'm doing justice to this at all. I feel like I'm not, but I'm telling you, this helped my heart. This helped my This is just a preacher preaching his heart to you, telling you, this is what I got in my Bible reading. You say, I don't get that much in my Bible reading. Friend, it ain't always going to be a nugget. Sometimes it's, it's just a little bit here and a little bit here. Thank God for the morsels, hey man. You can't live off a loaf of bread every day. You need a crumb from time to time to keep you hungry. Say man right there. Boy, if you get a whole loaf every time, you know what you're going to do? You're going to get so satisfied you don't have an appetite for it. Amen? I'm telling you what, when you get just a little bite, man, I'm telling you something that gets me. When my daughters want, it don't matter which one it is, and they make a they make a bowl of brownie mix. Man, I'm going to tell you something. I was just about coming to sin to get a hold of the best brownie in town. I'm a brownie lover, friend. I love me some brownie. I like them with corn. I like them with chocolate chips. I like them dark chocolate. I like them with ice cream. Say amen right there. I love a good brownie. I'm just telling you that's why I'm so fat. I love brownies. But let me tell you something about them brownies. I love the finished product, Brother James. I mean, there ain't nothing like it, man. But I'm going to tell you what. I like to walk over there. And uh, I'm going to just tell them I can't. I'm, it's, it, it, it don't matter. I will walk over there with that boat. Hannah, I've got the Hannah train right. Thank God. My other ones, they're just rebellious. You pray for them devils. But Hannah, I thank God one of them listens. I train her right. She don't never, now I'm telling you not never, she don't never make a pan of brownies where she don't get done mixing it. Boo! And she knows how to give the first fruits to the king. <laughs> and the king of the castle, you understand that? And she'll bring me the bowl. Yeah. And you know what's in the bowl, brother? She didn't. She purposely didn't scoop it all out. I think she does it on purpose. She just handfuls on purpose. And she said, here, Daddy, I know you want. And I get to licking that thing. Man, I promise you, I could lick a bowl so clean, it looks like it's been washed. <laughs> Are you listening to me? I'm talking about, hey! It's good, friend. But you know something, that final product's a good thing. That final product's a good thing. But sometimes, sometimes, listen, sometimes you just need a little, a little something. But, but, but you know what that taste in the bowl does? My point is this. The taste in the bowl makes me want more. It makes me want the final product. Are you, are you, I don't know if y'all getting that or not. See, when I get just a little bit in the Word of God, at least I'm in the Word of God. Amen. And if I just get a little morsel, you know what it makes me do? I'm going to dig some more. Because if I find a more, and every now and again, I know this don't seem like it to y'all, but I'm telling you, this preacher's having a good time right now. Because every now and again, I get right back in the book, and I'm looking for that little morsel, and bam, there's a whole loaf. And I'm like, man, that fed my soul. This fed my soul right here, what I'm about to share with you. I see the regrets. I see the recognition, but then I guess what I see? I see the return. I see the return. What do you mean the return? <clears throat> Look at verse 22. Notice what it says. So Naomi returned. Now, excuse me for just a minute. If there was a period right there or an exclamation point, we could shout, all night long and rejoicing that Naomi returned. Are y'all listening? That would be enough. But it doesn't stop there. Look at it. And Naomi returned. And what does it say? And who? Ruth. What is her title? The Moabitess. Mm. She returned. <clears throat> but she didn't come alone. She returned, Brother James. But she didn't come back by herself. Oh no! She brought a lost sinner. 
to the house of God with her because she had some influence somewhere along the line. I'm talking about a Moabitess girl. She returned and she brought her back. I see the regret, the realization, and the return. Can I just give that to you in a nutshell real quick? You know what that is right there? It's called repentance, friend. It's called repentance. You want me to give you another Bible verse? I know y'all looking at me like I lost my ever-loving mind. So let me turn over here real quick. Y'all just keep smiling and acting like you're still awake. Hey, man, it'll be just fine. I'm going to show you something right here, praise God. It'll help you. Amen. I'm telling you, there is something right there that'll help every one of us. Oh, yes, right here. Listen to this verse. Revelation and amen and chapter number 2 and verse number Four. It says, nevertheless, Jesus is speaking to the church there. He said, nevertheless, I have somewhat ought against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Now notice what he says in verse number five. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. Hey, remember your regrets. Where did you come from? There's some regret because I was there and now I'm not. There's some regret right there. He said, remember from whence thou art fallen. Notice what he says though. And he said this. He said, and repent. You know, repent. Realize that you're guilty. Amen. Amen. Recognize you're guilty. But he doesn't stop there. Here's the whole picture. Notice what he said. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent. Now notice what it says. And do the first works. You know what he just said? You need to remember. You need to repent. And you need to return. Or you need to repeat. That's all it is in a nutshell. That right there is a picture of genuine repentance. She had the regret. That's the conviction. She was convicted over her sin. She, she had that regret. Now, a lot of people get convicted, but that's as far as it goes. They never do anything with it. But she had to recognize she was guilty before God. She realized that she had forsaken the blessing of God. That's the, that's the best part of it. Because when you get honest with God and you confess that you're a sinner, guess what? That's when you begin to get to the place where you can return to a place, amen, that God intended you to be. You can turn direction. She returned. That turn, turn. She turned back to God. Thank God. I'm telling you. And she didn't go alone. She brought somebody with her. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a sad story. But it's not. It's not over yet. It, if, if, if there was not this verse, if verse 21 was not there, we would be depressed tonight going home depressed. But thank God, the Bible's not stopped. I see that she's back in fellowship. She didn't ever lose her salvation. Y'all understand that? She didn't lose her salvation just because she walked away from God. She didn't. She's not gonna die and go to hell, but she lost her fellowship. What was she? She didn't. She, that, God intends for bread to be a picture of fellowship. Say amen right there. That's why in Acts they went house to house and every house. And what they do? Come on now, y'all know your Bible. They broke bread. Amen. Breaking bread is biblical. That's why we Baptists are good at it. Amen. We got some things better than others. We don't know how to dress worth a flip, but we know how to eat. Say amen. <laughs> I'll leave that one alone. But I'm telling you right now. There was breaking bread. You know what bread represents? It represents fellowship. You know why we take the Lord's Supper? Why we did that back before Easter? Because we're identifying, we're fellowshipping with the Lord Jesus Christ in the suffering of His death, burial, and resurrection. That's what we're doing. We're fellowshipping. You know what baptism is? It's a picture of fellowship, identification. Are y'all with me? She's back in fellowship. She's back in fellowship, and she brought somebody with her. But watch this. This is so good. Y'all should have stayed and waxed the hatchet in but it's okay. Let me make a statement before I give you this last thing and we'll be done. This is what amazes me. This, this, this just, I can't wrap my mind around this, but this amazes me when I look at this book. Somehow, miraculously, I will say, even through all of the negative experiences in her life, Naomi somehow was able to maintain a mother's godly influence even if it was just over one of her daughter-in-laws. She didn't have the influence over her sons. She didn't have the influence with her husband that she should have had. Now that's not rebellion. There's a difference. A godly woman, listen to me, a godly woman that has the right kind of influence knows how to influence her husband without usurping authority. Amen. And, and let me just back that up. I'll preach on the men at another time. Amen. A godly man is smart enough and wise enough to know there's times you better shut up and listen to your wife. That ain't always the case. But there are some times when a man better learn to discern when his wife has more wisdom than he does. There's times my wife's been dead on. 
And I'm thankful for that. There's been times she said, honey, something about that individual don't give me the right feeling. And I'd be like, well, and I might blow it off at first and say, well, tell me more. Yeah, I've seen it happen with ladies, haven't we? Honey, there's something about that lady that creeps me out. Really? Well, I don't see that. But I'm going to listen to her more than I'm telling you right now because she got wisdom. And, 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 and I know this is hindsight. We're just speculating right now. But she could, how do you know she couldn't have had some influence with the limit? Like, Honey, you're the boss. I'm going to follow you. You are the boss. I, I get it. But, but can we consider? If we do this, if we leave this place, we're full. God's been good to us. Haven't we had these conversations in our own life? If we just walk away right now, in the minute, God's been, I don't know, I, I, it better be God. I want to know that God's leading us. That's not her usurping authority. That's just trying to have some wisdom because in her tongue, a virtuous woman, in her tongue is what? The law of kindness. Remember? There's what we talked about. So, so, but, but notice this, somehow, she didn't have influence over her husband. She lost the influence over her two sons. But somehow, through the midst of everything, it is factual, based on this authority of this book, she maintained somehow, Whatever she did, whatever she talked about, however she carried herself, there was something about her life that manifested a godly influence over one of her daughter-in-law's mm -hmm. Ruth. Now, that's just one. How many did she lose in the process? Mm -hmm. She lost her husband. She lost two sons. And a daughter-in-law. But if you add one more, that's five. And what's the number five in the Bible? Grace. Grace. It's all a picture of God's grace. You say, I don't see it yet. I'm trying to paint it. I'm not a good painter. But let me tell you what happens. She maintained. Listen. She maintained her influence. Her godly influence. And it is only because of this that she will now be able to experience the final point. We see the regrets. We see the realizations. Mm -hmm. We see the return. And because of all of that, because she maintained a godly mother's influence, a mother's godly influence, <laughs> now, now we can see the rejoicing. Mm -hmm. There's some rejoicing that takes place. The rejoicing, yes. You know what she's rejoicing about? You, I'm going to show you here in just a second to be done. I, I know it's simple. It's Sunday school material. But you know what she's rejoicing about? She's rejoicing about a blessed future. Mm. A blessed future. Now, I don't know how y'all think about things, but I'm going to be honest with you. Most of the time, if, if you marry into a family and, and, and the person that you married into dies, most of the time you go on about your life, especially if you don't have children. These two daughter-in-laws would have been perfectly fine to go on with their life and, and it's not that they wouldn't have loved Naomi. Obviously, they would have loved her because she was a part of their life. But now, there's really, the, do you realize the son, the, the two sons is what made the relationship? And when you take those out, there's nothing that has to be maintained. I mean, you're, it's not hateful. I'm just saying, these two girls weren't bound to Naomi anymore. They didn't have children to share, no grandchildren. So they, they were probably, and that's why Naomi said, go and find you a husband. Go live your life. Yet one of them said, I'm going to stay. Now, there's, there's so much more than what I can really convey here. But do you realize what kind of person Ruth had to be? How she had to really, God has really done a work in her life to the point there's been such an influence on her that even to, and I'm going to show you, even to the very end, she never leaves Ruth's side. Ruth never leaves Naomi's side. She even told her, where you die, that's where I'm going to die. Excuse me, how many of you think when God really started blessing her, she changed her mind? I don't think so. She said that in a pagan land when she went ahead and kept the word. I'll show you something though. Here's the rejoicing and I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. There's rejoicing. There's rejoicing of a blessed future. Chapter 2. Look at chapter 2 real quick. Real quick. Chapter 2 verse number 1 says, And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech. And his name was Boaz. And Ruth, the Moabitess, she's still called the Moabitess, there's a title that will never leave her. The Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. You know what's amazing, though? This is another picture of grace. The whole time, Naomi has absolutely, uh, uh, Ruth has absolutely no responsibility to Naomi. Not at all. 
None. But she's so in love with her and so in love with the way that she has influenced her, she's willing to take care of her widow mother-in-law that is no longer even her mother-in-law. They're not even kin now. But she's loving her because she's so godly. There's such a godly influence. She said this. She said, and she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her half, uh, it, it just happened to be, she just happened to chance. Her half, they found, was to lie on a part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. And then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It is the Moabitish damsel. Now let me tell you, there was a title there for a reason. I don't have time to deal with all that. And, and she came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. Before I go on, let me make one more statement to help us understand something. How in the world did a Moabitess girl understand what God, uh, how God treats those that are widows? Excuse me, how did she know that God in His Word has declared that you don't glean the corners of the field? They're for two types of people. You know what they're for? The widow and who? The fatherless. That's God. He said that. By the way, over in the book, that is, I believe it's the book of uh, James, or it's First Peter, a pure religion that is undefiled is to visit the fatherless and the widow. Now listen to me. How in the world did somebody in Moab know anything about the good mercy of God that he would take care of a widow? That she would go glean in the... That's, is that what she said? That I may go glean in the... How did she know that? Can I tell you how? She only could have known it by one person. And that would have been her mother-in-law. Naomi must have told her, let me tell you something while we're going back. Because God takes care of the widow. I know it's my fault that I'm a widow. I know I've had to bury my children. There's a lot of regret there. But I'll tell you one thing I know. My God's good. And He'll provide for us. If we can just get back to the house of God, I promise you, God has been faithful to take care of the widow and the fatherless and hallelujah to God. You and I fit the category. Let's go back to the house of God. And Naomi had done told Ruth something about cleaning. Ruth never doubted her one bit because as soon as they got back, she said, let me go find a field where I can glean and find us something to eat. That's all she was looking for. She didn't know that God was ordering her step and God would bring her to the right field. Now look at it in verse number 6. I'm sorry, verse number Verse 7 and uh, verse 8. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field. You don't need to go anywhere else, Ruth. I'm telling you, honey, just stay right here. I got a feeling God's in this. Ruth was a, a blessed woman, and Boaz was a man of God. Boaz recognized there's something different about this Moabitish girl. She's not out here flirting with the fellas. She's not out here giving herself to all the workers in the field. She's not flaunting her body. No, there's something different about her. She's carrying herself in a different way. He said, honey, you just stay right there. I'm going to make sure you're blessed. I'm telling you, the hand of God is all over this. And he said that right there. He said, stay in my field and abide here fast by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap and go thou after them. I Have I not charged the young men? Look at what he said. Have I not charged the young men? They shall not touch thee. Why? Because they know she's a Moabitess girl and everybody wants a piece of her. I mean, she's just a piece of meat to them. That's how they treated the Moabitess about his girl. They were prostitutes. Are you listening? And he told the fellows, don't nobody lay a finger on her. There's something different about her. She's had some kind of influence in her life that has made the difference. Now she's here. You make sure she's taken care of. And not only that, he's not done yet. Notice here, he said this, oh Lord. He said, uh, and when thou art thirst, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drunk. Oh, you don't even have to drink your own water. We're going to take care of you. We're going to give you what you need to eat. Make sure you have plenty to drink. Alright? You just stay right here. This is where God's blessed are. Your mom-in-law, maybe he told her, Naomi messed up. She knows what it's like to leave the house of God because of the famine. But I'm telling you, stay put, stay put, stay put. You say, what in the world? I'm telling you, watch it happen now. It's going to unfold. In verse number 10, then, oh my, she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, why have I found grace? You know what grace is? It's unmerited favor. She didn't deserve it. She knew it. She humbled herself. She recognized what have I done to deserve such favor? God is good. I'm telling you, it gets better, friend. And she said, what have I done that thou should take knowledge of me, seeing I'm a stranger? Is that not a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ? You and I were nothing but strangers and pilgrims, and he took notice of us, thank God, in our strangerness. He took notice of us when we were estranged to him, and he took note to care for us. Thank God, what a picture of Christ. That's not the half. 
It's not even over. Verse number 11, And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed me. That's called discernment. God showed him something. It hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thy husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. Mm, verse number 11 tells us, look at verse 12, the Lord, he's now talking about God. It's not me doing this, honey. It's not me giving you grace. It's the God of heaven who's been gracious to me. And you just came into a place where you're going to find out about this God. He said, the Lord recompense thy work. Notice what he said. And a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel under whose wings thou art come to trust. How did she come to trust under the wings of Almighty God? Because she had a mother-in-law that in the midst of everything chaotic in her life, in the midst of regret, in the midst of all the realizations, she never lost her godly influence to the point that it influenced this young lady to leave everything and everyone behind and come to the God who is a God she's never... And you know what that's called? Can I tell you something? You know what it's called? It's called faith. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. But notice he goes on. Then she said, Let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for that thou hast comforted me, for thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid. Though I be not like unto one of thine handmaids. Boy, there's a lot of salvation in here. I wish I had time to unpack it. I'm not like everybody else, and you've been kind to me. And you know something? There ought never be something. Can I just go ahead and run a rabbit here? I don't care if y'all need to leave, leave. I'm telling you, I'm having me a tie. Brother James, ought never nobody ever come to the door of the Harvest Baptist Church. I don't care what they look like. They look like they fell in their daddy's tackle box and washed their hair with Kool-Aid and covered the ink. To, I'm talking about ink up from head to toe. And they come into the house of God as a stranger. Now, not ever anybody come to this place where they don't feel the love of God uh, among the people that they know not and the God that they don't know it ought to be. We can extend the love of Christ to them and they would realize there's a God in heaven that loves me and I can come in to the family of God even though I don't know them. Thank God for that. Amen. Don't you tell me for a minute the Bible's not full of grace. Mm. She said, and Boaz said unto her, at mealtime, it gets better, he's just taking care of her. At mealtime, come thou hither and eat of the bread and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers and reached her parched corn and she did eat and was sufficed and left. When she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and reproach her not. And notice verse 16, and let some fall and let fall some, also some of the handfuls of purpose. In other words, do it on purpose. Just leave some extra for her. Handfuls of purpose for her and leave them that she may glean them and rebuke her not. I'm talking about how did she get to the place of rejoicing. Friend, I don't know who you are, where you come from, but if you ever came from that kind of lifestyle and you came into the house of God and you started seeing the blessing of God, it would be pretty evident you're in the right place. But it don't stop there. There's something else. I'm talking about a blessed future. She's rejoicing in a blessed future. Obviously, God's taking care of her, is he not? But that ain't the half. Turn over to chapter 4, real quick, real quick. Chapter 4, I want to show you something else. I want to show you something else. In chapter 4, I'm talking about a blessed future. Chapter 4, verse number 13. Fast forward past all that. In chapter number 13, I'm sorry, chapter 4, actually a few verses before this, Boaz has now purchased Ruth to be his wife. He's gone through the near kinsman because the near kinsman couldn't do it. He couldn't redeem her, and so therefore the next in line was Boaz. I'm skipping all that because so, I know you know your Bible and you're real smart. So, but get, I know you know this too, but let's be reminded. Verse 13, we're talking about rejoicing in a blessed future. Verse 13, so Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife. And when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. First child. She bare a son. And the women said unto Naomi, Now wait a minute, how come Naomi's still in the picture? See, y'all ain't getting that. She had no responsibility to Naomi whatsoever. Because her sons are already dead. They didn't have children. There was no grandchildren to share. There was really no reason for a relationship at all. But you know what kept the relationship? That woman had a godly influence over this one. And she said, I'm going to make sure that she has a place to be taken care of because she's, she really is a godly woman. And I'm telling you, when you see that, because now, now, fast forward, now Ruth, Ruth 
is married to Boaz. Neither one of them, I mean, I'm telling you, Naomi's got no dog in the fight. And all of a sudden, they have a baby. And now when they come to talk to Naomi, they realize this is the blessing of Naomi because Naomi kept her influence so much. That's how the Moabites got to the place. Amen. Because Naomi influenced her there. Now watch it says, And they came to Naomi and said, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. And she and he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life. She's lost her life. She lost her sons, lost her husband, but God's restored her. And a nourisher of thine old age, for thy daughter and law which loveth thee which is better to thee than seven sons hath borne him there's something special about this child yeah and Naomi took the child and laid it in her bosom and became nursing it Naomi is nursing the baby for Ruth and Boaz oh I'm talking about the blessings of God because watch this now and it says in verse 17 and the women her neighbors gave it a name saying there is a son born to Naomi Naomi didn't have a son but she had such an influence now that she's like an adopted grandma say amen right there because she's such a godly influence. Naomi has a son and guess what they called his name? They called his name Obed. You ever heard that name? Well just stay along. Stay along for the ride here because Obed, he is the father of Jesse. You ever heard of Jesse? Oh Jesse has a son too. He's a little bit more famous and Jesse is the father of David. Do you know who David is don't you? David was the king of Israel. The sweet psalmist of Israel. Amen and amen. The only one recorded in the Bible as a man after God's own heart but don't stop there. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez begot Hezron. Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot Abinadab. Abinadab begot Nashon. Nashon begot Solomon. Solomon begot Boaz. Boaz begot Obed. Obed begot Jesse. And Jesse begot David. Do you realize that right there is the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ? And hey, I'm telling you when a woman, a mother has a godly influence, you turn on a thorn to underestimate the power of a godly influence even over one. Because it was just one, but the influence was so strong that that very one got in the grace of God. She came to know the Lord, and because of that, God said, I tell you what I'll do. I'll do something you would never do. I'm going to put her in the direct lineage and bloodline of my son, Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, friend, the influence, the godly influence of a mother should never be undervalued or underestimated. Because you're going to have an influence one way or another. The question is, is your influence godly enough to make an eternal difference in someone else's life that may not even be your own child? Ruth was a mama to that little baby. But they so saw the hand of God that they said, Naomi has a baby. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She was so influential in that life. She had no dog in the fight. She had no lineage in it. Yet God said, I'm going to tell you the importance of godly influence. You don't know the next little Moabitess that you might influence to come to know the sweet Savior and to come to know the grace of God so much so that it might change an eternal destiny of an entire lineage all because of one woman who in the midst of adversity she at least she at least she did a lot of things wrong but at least she maintained a godly influence and it's stuck with one. It seems like it's worthless sometimes. Well, if I do that, I'm going to lose every friend I got. If I maintain a godly influence, I'm not going to be a good leader. You might think, I'm saying all the reality. Well, if I do that, I, I, nobody's going to think I'm cool. Nobody's going to like me. If I maintain a godly influence, people really aren't going to get close to me. That may be so. You may lose four out of five. She lost her husband, two sons, and a daughter-in-law. But thank God for the one daughter-in-law who said, you know what? There's something real about this. I'm going to stick with it. <laughs> because without that, we wouldn't even have the beautiful picture that we have that brings us directly to the... You know what, they, you know what the Bible calls Jesus? He's referred to as the son of David. Read your Bible. Now, let me ask you a question. McKenzie's making her way to the piano. 
See, that took me a minute to get there, didn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> I don't think that I can stress with enough zeal just how valuable a mother's godly influence is. You may lose your own children. I'm not saying that's going to happen. You may not. You, but, but, but let me tell you something. Even if you lose your family, you lose your spouse, you lose your children. Don't lose your godly influence because you don't know, you don't know the one person that you're going to make a difference in their life. I'm going to tell you what will happen. This doesn't just apply to women. If every one of us is God's children, don't take this to heart and realize we have an influence on everybody around us. Everybody that works a job, you have an influence on the people you work with. Whether it's good or bad, I can't tell. I'm not gone. But I think you probably know. <clears throat> and if you're not influencing people in a godly way, you might be sending the next crowd, the next generation to a devil's hell simply because you have the ability, you have the truth, and you have the reality to show a godly influence. You say, you don't know what I'm going through. Apparently, Naomi went through some things, but even in the midst of that, she had enough about her to maintain enough of God that it caused Ruth to say, I'm cleaving to this one. There's something different in the midst of that person. Let's stand together. Father. Well, my friends, we just heard a message from the pulpit of Harvest Baptist Church. I pray that it was a help and a blessing to your life. This is no doubt a place where God's Word changes lives. If God's Word was a blessing or a help to your life today, we'd like to hear from you. Please write to us at Harvest Baptist Church, P.O. Box 110, Allen, Texas 75013. Again, is P.O. Box 110, Allen, Texas 75013. May God richly bless you and the preaching of His Word. Have a wonderful day.